see you in Rayman 4! Rayman Origins is the fourth game in the main Rayman series, released a whopping eight years after Rayman 3. While Sega was busy churning out Sonic games, it seems Ubisoft saw the writing on the wall for the genre and focused their efforts elsewhere. But the market was shifting in 2011. During this time, a player base developed for more independent-styled games, signaling a good time for Rayman to make his triumphant return. Sadly, Rayman Origins bombed, selling just 50,000 units in its first month. Yeah, maybe Ubisoft was a bit off with their projections, but despite selling poorly, Rayman Origins was a critical darling, earning praise across YouTube, magazines, and online publications. IGN scored the game a 9.5 out of 10, noting, Rayman Origins is special, rare, and precious, a truly realized vision at the top of its genre. GameSpot gave the game an 8.5 out of 10, stating, The fact remains that this is a charming, gorgeous, and thoroughly entertaining 2D platforming experience. Finally, Joystick scored the game a perfect 5 out of 5 stars, proclaiming, Every nuance is positively dripping with goofy, heart-swelling joy. So, which figure is more representative of the quality found in Rayman Origins? The review scores or the sales? Let's take a look. The first thing I like about Rayman Origins is how everything is an event. Even something as mundane as selecting a save file is treated with the utmost care. Rolling through the three slots at the right time will reveal a song of sorts. After reluctantly selecting a new file, the opening cutscene kicks off. Raymond and friends are chilling on the snoring tree, with each of their actions creating a melody, which annoys a granny living under the snoring tree. After shouting at them to pipe down, the characters continue on their way. The old granny then becomes furious. Raymond's disobedience is rewarded with a swarm of dark tunes who capture our heroes as well as recapture all of the elect tunes and the fairies, called nymphs in this game, inhabiting the Glade of Dreams. And with that, the game kicks off. After breaking free from the cage and swinging off the Bubble Dreamer's beard, Murphy appears and lets the player know they will need to collect Electunes to fix the old man. And that is pretty much it as far as the plot goes. Curiously, rather than continuing with the successful gameplay formula found in Rayman 2 and 3, Rayman Origins returns to the 2D gameplay style which kicked off his career. And speaking of kicked off, Origins wastes little time getting the player into the action. Batilla is asking for help and then is whisked away in a strange cage. The player will naturally want to chase, which marks another main focus of Origins. The game wants the player to keep moving. Platforms will dip and sway, but are laid out in a way where it unfolds at the perfect time if the player just keeps running right. Granted, new players will probably miss a few of the visual cues and miss a jump or just choose to explore, but there is an undeniable flow to the game that is present right from the get-go. Anyway, after catching up with Batilla, the player is given the power to attack. With this new power, progress can be made through the rest of the stage. Rayman Origins is structured like a typical game from the 90s. Initially, the player can only visit the gibberish jungle, and inside the gibberish jungle are a series of levels that must be played sequentially. However, the second to last level of each land will have an Electune requirement for entry. If the player has enough Electunes, they can proceed, and beating this stage will lead to the last level where the player hops aboard Mosquito, which acts as a transition to the next land. Using this game structure, the player will make their way to the Desert of Didgeridoos, Gourmand Land, Sea of Serendipity, and finally, the Mystical Peak. While collecting is hardly the main goal for simply beating Rayman Origins, some exploration will be necessary. Much like the original Rayman, finding and breaking cages containing Electunes is an objective in each stage. Rather than being out in the open, each cage is hiding in a secret room. Like Rayman 2 and 3, when the player is near one of these, an audible Help Me can be heard, alerting the player to their presence. 
Each secret room acts as an obstacle course, challenging the player to utilize the skills learned in the stage to destroy all of the enemies on the screen to unlock the cage. Cages will not reward all of the electoons found on each stage's medallion, though. Also returning to the game are Lums. There are hundreds of these in most stages, but they aren't always sitting around in the open. Rather, defeating enemies, bouncing off platforms, and other tasks may be required to make them appear. This duality of cage finding and lum snatching does a nice job of blending the exploring nature of the first game with the light collecting nature of the 3D follow-ups to create a cohesive experience. Of course, repeating the same actions through two dozen levels would get awfully repetitive, which is where the set pieces come in. In the gibberish jungle, there are a number of obstacles for the player to interact with. First, parts of a plant can be punched, causing their petals to retract, often dumping enemies to their doom. Alternatively, punching them can reveal platforms. Rayman's attacking can also be used to lead the way forward, like punching through breakable objects. He also has a downward attack, which is great for taking out enemies in a single thrust and can also be useful for bouncing off springy objects, allowing the player to reach greater heights than a normal jump. Speaking of attacking, Rayman can charge his fist, like in the past games, to do great damage. But with other ways to dispatch enemies, I rarely found myself using it. Instead, holding the run button and then punching is often more effective. Enemies will smash into each other, creating a chain of destruction. The basic punch is therefore most useful for triggering objects. While the gibberish jungle gave the player the power to attack after freeing Batilla, the desert of didgeridoos has the player chasing down another bodacious nymph to earn the power to fly. This is a misnomer, of course, as Rayman's helicopter hair is more like a gentle glide. The desert of didgeridoos also contains new obstacles for the player to contend with. Similar to Bandland, this world contains many music motifs. Drums can be bounced off of, but there is also electric lines to contend with. Some of these have buttons, which can be used to turn off the power, adding a light puzzle element to the platforming. Buttons can also be used to generate a music staff, with enemies acting as the notes. The desert also utilizes the newly acquired helicopter hair with gusts of wind. Sometimes these are small, isolated currents, other times the entire map might contain an updraft. In either case, the mechanic does a nice job putting the new power to use and helps the world feel sufficiently different from the previous. Finally, there are moving snake sections, basically turning some stages into auto-scrollers. After this is Gourmandland. Curiously, this world houses the game's ice stages as well as the lava stages, and of course, freeing a nymph will grant a new power, in this case the power to change size. At various points and levels will be funnel-like shapes, which will cause Rayman to shrink and grow back to his normal size. While small, Rayman weighs less, which changes how he interacts with certain objects. Watermelons don't rotate based on his position, and lemon slices won't push through the fork. More importantly, Rayman has a sort of charging attack, allowing him to dash in four directions. This can work at any point in the jump arc too, changing how a player might choose to face certain obstacles. The lava stages offer some additional timing elements as well, like using this tube of fire to hit a pot, causing its lid to burst open, creating a higher platform. Moving along, the Sea of Serendipity marks the return of the pirate theme. Freeing the world's nymph will also grant Rayman the power to dive. Up until this point, Rayman could jump into water without taking damage, but was limited to just floating along the surface. With the power to dive, the player is now free to explore any water area. Of course, this leads to a full water stages, though this isn't as bad as it sounds. Honestly, the gameplay is super simple. Button presses are not required to sink or rise. Rather, Rayman controls perfectly fine with the analog stick and even has a spin attack. It honestly plays almost exactly like the Sega Saturn classic Knights, which is a good thing. The Sea of Serendipity also relies heavily on another gameplay gimmick, staying in the light. This was actually introduced earlier, having the player stay in the light to avoid swarms of insects, but this concept is carried over into the water as well. It seems these grabby arms are also afraid of the light and won't dare enter it. This creates new challenges for the player where one is tasked with identifying the pattern of moving lights to stay safe. 
This brings us to the mystical peak. Here, the final nymph grants Rayman the power to run on walls, which is the last power earned in the game. This power is actually pretty substantial, on par with the helicopter hair. With it, any time a floor panel curves upward, the player can continue running, and even run on ceilings. Mystical Peak also has cool industrial obstacles like rolling gears and this neat elevator. And of course, the level design relies heavily on the use of wall running for progression, with normal jumps and wall jumps being insufficient. So after about three and a half hours of gameplay, the five nymphs have been freed along with a ton of lums, so all should be set for the Bubble Dreamer to restore peace to the Glade of Dreams. However, after arriving at the Moody Clouds, we learn we need to rescue four kings before proceeding through the Dreamer's door. Yeah, I'm not going to lie, I have no idea what the game is talking about. After consulting the manual, it turns out this Bubble Dreamer guy is pretty important, with his dreams directly impacting the health of the Glade of Dreams. As he is not currently well, he is having nightmares. These nightmares have turned the four kings into nightmarish creatures who Rayman needs to rescue. As a plot point giving objectives to the player, this works well enough, but honestly, without consulting external reading materials, Rayman Origins does a lousy job explaining or showing what is happening. Anyway, with the this plot twist, four new lands are shown on the Glade of Dreams map, each containing new levels to conquer. These new lands match the previous themes though, so the ticklish temples resemble the gibberish jungle, the grumbling grottos mirror the desert of didgeridoos, the luscious lakes match Gourmandland, and the angsty abyss copies Sea of Serendipity. While this might seem a bit repetitive at first, each of the four lands offers enough diversity to support another 20 levels. And of course, Raymond has five new powers, so old landscapes can offer new challenges. Speaking of challenge, the second half of Raymond Origins definitely starts upping the difficulty. In the ticklish temples, the player will need to kick flowers in the air and then land on the platforms they generate, navigate around a ton of spiked obstacles, and finally get chased up a mountainside. The grumbling grottos offers a ton of swarm segments where the player needs to race from light source to light source as it dims around Rayman. The windy areas become more claustrophobic with denser enemy patterns. Quicksand is introduced, which adds immense pressure to the player to navigate the obstacles. The auto-scrolling snake segments become more difficult with a greater emphasis on wall jumping. Luscious lakes add swaying pans in the restaurant area, and the icy areas include new chase sequences, mirroring those found in the Sea of Serendipity, and these forks which fly right across the stage. Last but not least, Angsty Abyss has this clever Pac-Man style puzzle which I found incredibly charming. Now I should briefly touch upon those four kings before moving further, after all they are needed to unlock the dreamer's door. The first king is some sort of octopus. The second is a giant chicken. The third takes place inside the stomach of a large monster. And the fourth is a serpent. Upon defeat, each boss creature will shrink back down into king form. This will release their magic, and the nymphs can summon their power to open the door to the rest of the moody clouds. Curiously, the magician found in the beginning stages offering guidance to the player now warns the player not to proceed any further. These final stages offer a whole new slew of obstacles to contend with, like lasers, lightning, spikes, robots who cannot be defeated, only pushed off ledges, crushers, and this slick rotating maze. Clearing these final stages will take the player to the final stage of the main campaign, affectionately called The Reveal. Here, the friendly magician rips off his star and reveals himself as a bad guy. It turns out he is a fan of Mr. Dark from the very first game, and is no friend at all. How is a player supposed to figure this out? Well, this poster in the background says, I love Mr. D. Yeah, pretty cryptic. The player then runs through repeats of the octopus boss as well as the chicken, both now piloted by the magician. If the player clears these, they'll arrive back at the magician's lair. Next, the magician takes off and the player needs to chase him through an obstacle course. Fittingly, this is the hardest part of the main game, requiring near perfect timing to make it through a whirlwind of moving and rotating platforms mixed with plenty of saw blade obstacles waiting to tear Rayman apart. The game ends with Rayman piloting Mosquito, chasing the magician who is aboard his flying battleship. 
Try as one might, there isn't actually a way to defeat this ship, despite triggering billowing smoke. Instead, the magician eventually flies right into a giant container filled with energy. Presumably, this Mr. Dark wannabe was behind the game's events all along. Anyway, this container explodes, ridding the bubble dreamer of his nightmares, and the game ends exactly where it began, on the snoring tree. And then, of course, the credits roll. One cannot talk about Rayman Origins without talking about the presentation. Graphically, Rayman Origins is a stunning game. I'm playing the Xbox 360 version, which runs at 1080p and looks amazing. I assume the PS3 and PC ports offer similar or identical fidelity. Before I forget, I should also mention this is technically available on the Xbox One thanks to backwards compatibility. I actually did my non-recorded run on an Xbox One S. The game did freeze once, but other than this single hiccup, the game performed flawlessly with no glitches or frame rate stumbles whatsoever. The upscaling to 4K was excellent as well. Anyway, the high definition 2D visuals look absolutely gorgeous. There is anti-aliasing, so all of the sprites have smooth edges with no jaggies to be found anywhere. As the artwork is all massive and detailed, rotations and zoom effects all look terrific, with slight blurring only occurring during the most extreme zooming. Transparency effects are aplenty with subtle waves of sand dust, light rays, water particles, and smoke. But let's be honest, the hardware of the day was more than capable of running this this style of game, so it should come as no surprise it runs so smoothly. Honestly, it is the art direction that really steals the show here. It's clear a talented team of artists poured their heart and soul into the project. First, Rayman, his pals, and the enemies all look like characters ripped straight out of an animated feature. Movements are as smooth as the frame rate, and motions have an exaggerated look to them. And the environments are just incredible, again fitting the animated feature motif. Sprite are detailed and it's difficult to identify any sort of repeating pattern on any specific screen. There are little touches that help give a sense of depth as well. Backgrounds might be blurred out, for example, helping them look distant despite the lack of 3D space. There is plenty of parallax as well, with layered backgrounds in addition to the occasional foreground object. Color is expertly utilized. Some areas are vibrant and really pop off the screen. Others are more dark and dingy. The contrast is excellent too. The fiery liquid offers a nice contrast to the deep red backgrounds, drawing the player's eye to the danger. Despite the vibrant colors and detailed backgrounds, nothing ever gets lost either. Rope swings, enemies, and other level features always stand out, giving the player visual indicators on what is what. The artist did a masterful job mixing luscious environments for players to oogle at without compromising the gameplay. As beautiful as Rayman Origins is visually, I think the audio actually surpasses it. It. And I'm not talking about the voice acting either. As Ubisoft seemed unsure how to handle voice acting in this series at large, they settled on a compromise. Each character is voiced by a real voice actor, but they speak in Pig Latin. As there isn't much of a story in Rayman Origins, and the game retains a playful atmosphere, the silly English variant is actually fitting. With that out of the way, the game's soundtrack is outstanding. The bold visual style deserved some bold music, and the composers delivered. While Rayman 2 and 3 had solid soundtracks, I wouldn't use the word catchy to describe either of them. Rayman 1, on the other hand, had some real earworms, and the following ditty hasn't left me since the moment I first heard it. Rayman Origins manages to combine the best elements of both styles to create music that is both atmospheric and pleasant to listen to, but also catchy as hell. Seriously, some of these melodies are terrific, and a few days removed from the game, they are still stuck in my head. The reason for this is the main composer for the game, Christoph Herall, doesn't seem to be a gamer, with most of his work being done for TV and independent films. With no concept of what video game music is supposed to be, the music found in Rayman Origins is quite distinct and unlike anything else I've heard before. The main background instrument in the gibberish jungle, for example, is a Jew's harp or mouth harp. It's a strange sound, but absolutely works in the context of Rayman's fantasy settings. The desert of didgeridoos, of course, leans heavily on didgeridoos, and the wooden instrument matches beautifully with the windy settings. Gourmandland has a wonderful mix of mariachi and beats one might find in an old western film. 
film. The seas of serendipity sound like a 1940s musical, complete with gibberish vocals. The mystical peaks has orchestrated music with distinct chanting. All of it is wonderful to listen to, and I'm really not doing it justice. There are so many genres present and a ton of exotic instruments and sounds I've just never heard, so it's hard for me to put it all into words. Needless to say, between the catchy compositions and deep song progressions, Rayman Origins is filled to the brim with music that is every bit as pleasing as the visuals. Another great touch are all of the little jingles. Nabbing Lum Kings will start a timed mini challenge where the yellow lums will turn red and count as double while a timed jingle plays. The cages located behind secret doors also play a familiar tune with the mouth harp to let the player know a challenge is about to begin. Defeating all of the enemies in a room will kick off a victory jingle. Better still, collecting lums and defeating certain enemies will play music notes, sometimes creating little tunes of their own. It's all expertly done and really elevates the audio presentation to the next level. But of course, a large amount of gameplay variety, pleasing visuals, and amazing audio aren't enough to make a game great. A platformer really needs great controls and level design built around said controls. Now I want to break the gameplay into three main parts. First the mosquito sections, then the bosses, and finally the game's bread and butter, platforming. Mosquito is featured prominently throughout Rayman Origins, usually as the final stage in each land, but is also sprinkled as a gameplay type within in various stages, while in most versions of the original Rayman, attacking was performed with the fist. In the Atari Jaguar version of the game, Mosquito himself spit out projectiles. That concept is carried over into this game. Mosquito can also inhale enemies and then launch them back out. While this isn't required, and I certainly underutilize the mechanic, it does offer a layer of depth and I suspect is needed to hit the maximum lum requirements at the end of the stages. In any case, these actually play like the shooters of yesteryear. The screen automatically scrolls, there is a great blend of shooting down enemies and avoiding obstacles, and bonus lums are awarded if an entire chain of enemies are taken out, and if you want to earn electoons, one will need to take advantage. Bullets can also be ricocheted off the environment, useful for hitting impossible to reach enemies, and later required for progression. It all works really well, and even features auto fire, though button mashing will yield a faster firing rate. The mosquito stages are also where many of the bosses are found. The first chicken encounter, for example, requires the player to inhale barrels and then launch them in order to damage the boss. This eel requires the player to destroy each segment of the enemy as it wanders about the screen. However, not all bosses utilize Mosquito. This golem uses regular old Rayman, for example. This also teaches the player the bosses themselves don't really have a weak point. Rather, a bubble will occasionally appear, which then needs to be hit. For the first half of the game, the bosses are all relatively simple and easy enough to take down. When it comes to the second half of the game, and freeing the four kings, things are a little rougher. This octopus thing is a real pain. While on the ceiling, she telegraphs her attack allowing the player enough time to react to danger and learn its pattern. However, when it is on the ground, its animation is the same whether it is going to charge or begin jumping. Without any visual cues to react to, victory can only be achieved via trial and error. This chicken boss offers a similar dilemma. Its final attack is a counterclockwise blast. Unfortunately, it moves much faster than Rayman's float allows, meaning first time players are going to get blasted. On repeat playthroughs, I knew to stay on the bottom of the screen before it begins this attack phase, but again, trial and error. 
This giant monster thing also gave me fits and I found it to be the hardest boss of the main campaign. The little bobs don't stay on the screen very long, so if you don't get the bulb in time, Rayman is going to plummet into the lava causing death. After memorizing the timing, I could anticipate the final appearance, but as the footage shows, I'm making a leap of faith well before it appears. The fourth boss offers a similar dilemma. The serpent moves at the same speed as Rayman swimming, making it nearly impossible to intercept the bulb located on its tail while avoiding its massive jaws. It wasn't until memorizing its entire path around the stage where I was able to hit the bulb three times and claim victory. Granted, none of these encounters are very long, so the trial and error doesn't drag down the pace of the game, and the skill level required for completion is not superhuman. But when compared to the platform, the bosses are definitely a low point. The high point is, of course, the platforming. First, Rayman controls beautifully. It's worth noting this is the first modern platformer where I actually use the analog stick instead of the D-pad, so that is saying something. There's an unbelievable smoothness to the controls that works really well with the analog stick, and I didn't find myself defaulting back to the safety of the D-pad when the action got frantic. So, where does the smoothness come? come from? Well, on the surface, Rayman doesn't seem all that different from most platformers, old or new. He can jump reasonably high, his acceleration is quick, and his speed normal, preventing any sort of twitchy feeling. All pretty standard features for a side-scroller. However, it is the way Rayman interacts with the environments that is so special. Like many platformers, Rayman is extremely linear. Paths through stages are generally left to right affairs, or bottom to top, not unlike many 8-bit platformers. While these games limited diagonal movement because of hardware limitations, Rayman Origins does it as a design choice, only it's not to be nostalgic. Rather, it makes it very intuitive for the player to react to what's ahead. Now, I'm not a speedrunner by any means, nor do I feel my gaming skills are particularly special for that matter, but after a few hours with Rayman Origins, I began to notice I was always holding down the run button, and the game works brilliantly with this mechanic. You see, Rayman stops dead in his tracks when throwing a punch, but when doing a running punch, Rayman will keep moving forward, and if the player maintains forward momentum, the level layouts will generally reward the player with perfect platform and enemy placement, allowing for a sort of flow that permeates the entire adventure. Sometimes this is out of necessity, like the light rapidly fading from around Rayman, or a swarm of angry enemies chasing the player. And of course, wall running, but more often than not, moving quickly offers the most reward for the player. There's a certain flow to the gameplay mechanics that is hard to describe, but Rayman effortlessly switches from running to jumping to hovering to grabbing to attacking in the most fluid of ways. Combined with the level design that always places obstacles and challenges just in front of the player, giving enough time to react, creating an immensely satisfying experience as many challenges are constantly being overcome. And in this way, Rayman Origins is one of the most gratifying platformers I've ever played. There is a lot of depth as well. As I review footage, I can see room for improvement as I make little mistakes here and there. But replay value isn't just found in trying to perfect runs. For completionists, there is of course collecting all of the lums in each stage, rewarding electunes, and filling up those medallions. But there are also chest challenges, which ultimately reward another stage and boss, and time attack challenges, neither of which I got to explore fully, so I won't pretend to be an expert. Another thing I didn't get to try was the four-player cooperative or uncooperative mode, which reviewers raved about back in 2011. Not only is the game play and level design excellent, the overall structure of the game is sublime. The difficulty curve is near perfect. The opening lands are relatively easy, but the final lands offer some genuine challenges that will demand precision from even the most experienced of players. But the challenge is never overwhelming because the game gradually introduces new concepts to the player before ratcheting up the difficulty. The wall jump is not talked to the player via a text bubble, but rather the level dead ends with a lump path guiding the player to discover the maneuver, for example. The behavior of the ice blocks is taught to the player very logically. A lum is hiding in this ice block, and most players will smash down to rescue it. This results in the green cube dropping and the blue cube staying put, giving the player the exact information they need to get past future ice puzzles without getting crushed. The first time the fork is introduced, the player will naturally bounce
bounce off an enemy, allowing the fork to fly underneath, showing the behavior of the obstacle without surprising the player. This mechanic can then be abused to take down enemies. And of course, the previously mentioned ricocheting bullets of Mosquito. The progression and design found in Rayman Origins is perfect. Nothing found in the game is too obtuse and no challenge too frustrating. Like many platformers of this particular time, there are no lives and checkpoints are frequent, meaning a player is free to retry tougher segments in the game as many times as they like without having to redo massive chunks of the game. Rayman pushes the player to explore each each level for secret rooms, but the gentle cries for help give the player an audible clue for their location so time isn't wasted looking in the wrong location. While exploration is not a focus of the game, there is an electune requirement to finish each land, so the player will need to test their platforming proficiency and power of observation to seek out secret rooms. And because the level structure generally flows like an old NES game, leaps of faith are never required. Everything in Rayman Origins just works really well. The platforming is excellent, rivaling the smoothness found in Mario games. The swimming isn't tedious, but rather feels like nights. And finally, the shooting never feels out of place, but instead breaks up the action at just the right moments while retaining a high level of quality. The charm is off the charts, from the pig Latin the characters speak, the beautiful landscapes to the subtle nods to arcade classics like Pac-Man and Space Invaders. There's always something new around every corner to keep a player's interest through the 7 hour run time, and more impressively, there is enough depth to the design to keep players coming back well past the initial time investment. Now, I've beaten and reviewed dozens of platformers on this channel, spanning from popular 8-bit titles like DuckTales to the obscure like Tempo on the 32X. I've beaten platformers hailing from Japan like Castle of Illusion to those from Europe like Soccer Kid and Chuck Rock 2, and even American-developed games like Gex. My experience with the genre is vast spanning multiple generations of games with unique flavors of many different countries. So when I say this, I'm not speaking from a place of ignorance, but I'll be damned if Rayman Origins isn't the finest 2D platformer I've ever played. I can think of no other title that controls so smoothly, allowing a player to effortlessly perform multiple maneuvers without a single hiccup. I can think of no other game that is both frustration-free yet so insanely challenging. I can think of no other game which blends multiple gameplay styles without any feeling out of place, and I can think of no other title which blends together beautiful art that feels so unrestrained, yet still fitting within the confines of an interactive game. The attention to detail found on the file select screen, where perfect player inputs results in something special, is found within almost every crevice of Rayman Origins. Sales numbers be damned, Rayman Origins is one of the most polished and most entertaining platformers I have ever played, and is with Without a doubt, a masterpiece.